I'm Rob Stelmar, one of the counselors here at the high school. I want to thank you all for coming out this evening to Roadmap to College, which is back in the PAC after last year's hiatus due to COVID. So I'm glad we're back. Yes. Very happy about that. Last year was virtual, and I want to thank Paul again, who's hiding over there in the corner, um, for doing his videos for us. We really appreciate it. Um, but we're back, so it's great. And um, we have a, a, a all-star lineup today. Um, leading off will be uh, Rob Frannick, for the editor-in-chief of the Princeton Review, who's come out from New York to talk to our families. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, a couple of flyers you got. Uh, one is the uh, one that uh, has the schedule for this evening. There is a QR code on the back from Princeton Review, if you don't mind at some point taking that uh, survey for them and for us. We really appreciate it. Um, just put your phone up to it and you'll be able to take that at a later date. Um, we have three locations this evening. Um, the uh, Rob is in here for an hour and then we have Paul, which I will introduce him later, um, but he's over there, uh, the masked man. Um, he will be in here for um, essays, college essays. Um, but we also have a junior college, um, two presentations on junior college, the advantages of the junior college and the honors program at Fullerton College in particular, and those will be in the library uh, this evening on the schedule. And then if the CSU workshop, application workshop, we have a rep from uh, Cal State Fullerton that's here that will be in the cafeteria to help students with their applications. The UC was unable to send someone to us uh, with their COVID restrictions, but UC Santa Barbara has a great tutorial, step-by-step -step with video, so there is a QR code for that on uh, our schedule as well. Um, and then finally, we um, are going to have a parent information series. It's our second in a series of uh, almost monthly, not every month though, uh, meetings with parents to uh, help them and empower them to help you make uh, your students successful. And this one is on SEL. It is next Wednesday at Laurel Elementary School. We hope you can join us for that. All the only information is here on the flyer. And now I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to Rob Frannick. Thank you. Excellent, Rob, thank you. Mr. Stelmar, thank you. Folks, it's good to see all of you here uh, tonight. Uh, again, my name is Rob. I'm editor-in-chief at the Princeton Review. I spend most of the academic year on the road talking to three groups, students, parents, and counselors. I totally geeked out uh, tonight in preparation for, for tonight's event. Uh, counted up how many events I did the year before COVID took hold, 107. However, I have far dwarfed that number, as Mr. Kanarek has, uh, and giving lots of online events over the last year and a half of time. But I am so grateful uh, to be back in front of uh, students, parents, and counselors tonight. That all said, uh, I promised, Mr. Stelmar, that while I had you here for the roughly the next 45 or 50 minutes, uh, two, uh, two distinct promises. Number one, that we would talk about issues that were near and dear to the hearts of likely every college-bound student and their extended families in this room. The things that I promised Ms. Stelmar that we talk about is number one, how do we as students actually find colleges or universities that are going to be the best fits for us? And how do we as families not break the bank to pay for these schools? These are important issues to us, yes or no? Yes, yes they are. Folks, I think myself, my dear colleague, Mr. Canarek, certainly Mr. Stomar, and your full team here at Brea, I think we all know a lot about both of those issues of finding fit and paying for school. That said, I promised, Rob, that while I had you here for the next 45 minutes of time, I would try to keep our time together as interactive and not boring as possible. Keeping true to my promise, Allie, we're going to, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. You can call them ice breakers, but I call them ice smasher questions, exercises, that I'm going to compel you to do over the next 45 minutes of time. Um, here is my first ice smash. It is the easiest question that I will pitch out to you tonight. And all you need to do to answer this question is simply to raise your hand and it's an appropriate question for every college-bound student, their parent, extend every soul in this room can answer this question, and all you need to do to answer it is to simply raise your hand. Here is the question. Please raise your hand, students, parents, extended family members, if you are concerned about getting into a good college or concerned about your kids getting into a good college. Okay, put your hands down. Folks, hear my voice, hear Mr. Canarek's voice, hear Mr. Stelmar's voice, hear our voices when we say that whether you decide to move on to a great graduate school or a professional school after you graduate from college, or you decide to move on to a great 
first time career. Well, please raise your hands. As students, parents, doesn't matter who you are. If you are scared, stressed, or nervous about the college process, scared, stressed, or nervous about the college process, put them up. Folks, we're going to geek out here for a second. Please keep your hands up in the air. Folks in the front, please look at folks in the back. See some of those hands up in the back. Okay, put your hands down. Folks, we have to understand with mathematical certainty, no matter who we are, how well-intentioned, how well-educated, how thoughtful we may be around the college admission process, we are all human, and we're all likely a little scared, a little stressed, a little nervous. We know this, not just because of our quick straw poll here tonight, but um, one of the things that I love to do is to talk to students and parents, um, and counselors as well, but what I really, really love to do is find out survey information from college-bound students and their parents. And you'll hear me reference this over the next 45 minutes of time. We have an annual survey at the Princeton Review. It's called College Hopes and Worries. And we had just shy of 15,000 college-bound students and their parents complete the survey this past year. And we found out that college-bound students and their parents agreed 100% of the time on just one issue around the college process. And that one issue that they agreed on 100% of the time was their biggest fear, their biggest worry, their biggest stressor around the college process. And that biggest fear, worry, and stressor was money, Allie. Specifically, the amount of debt that students were likely going to incur to pay for college. I see some folks nodding their heads. Folks, if you are nervous, students, parents, about navigating the financial co process uh, around college, the college cost process in general, not to saddle your kids with too much debt or to saddle yourselves with too much debt as you move through the process, number one, you are not alone. I'm in a unique position at the Princeton Review, uh, and then I get to survey all of these folks. So I said, okay, listen, we have this annual survey. I understand the debt is a big fear factor for students and parents, but what do students and parents actually think college is going to cost? John Favreau, I'm going to ask you to hit that a couple of times. I should also tell you folks, I'm going to send you home with this entire presentation deck so you can feel free to furiously take notes. That's, that's good, John. Uh, you can feel free to furiously take notes tonight, but you needn't take a single note. As long as you use that QR code, I'm just going to get your contact and I'll, I'll send it on to you. But anyway, so we said, <clears throat> we said, listen, we understand that you're nervous around debt, but what do students and parents actually think college is going to cost? I also share an equal distaste, as Mr. Canerac does, in reading slides off of PowerPoint. That said, I am going to give you just the sense of what this says here. You can read this just as well as I can. Out of the nearly 15,000 folks that we talked to, 37% said it's going to cost me $100,000 or more to go to school. 26% said $75,000 to $100,000. John, let's hit that button one more time. Now, we collect this data at the Princeton Review. The folks at the College Board who creates the SAT, every one of the 38 AP exams, they, they collect it as well, called total cost of attendance. And that's tuition, room and board, fees and books, the big four. So let's try to answer this question. This is an ice smasher exercise that I'm going to force you to go through. Some brave souls are going to start to shout out this answer. Folks, tuition, room and board, and this is for public schools in-state tuition. So in-state tuition, room and board fees and books for a one-year average across the states. What does it cost to go to school? Shout it out from your seats. I want to hear it. $10,000. So $40,000. Pardon me. $20,000. $30,000. $200,000. You see, you wait the extra beat, Paul, and all the interesting answers come out. We have a low of 20, a high of 200. Anybody else? I'm sorry? 60, 25. $40,000. John, let's hit that one more time. We have some solace for some folks in this room. $22,180 is the average, again, average across the states for one year of public college. But folks, let us not stop there. Let us look to the sometimes heart-stoppingly expensive side of the list. Tuition, room and board, fees and books for one year of private college or university. What does it cost? Shout it out from your seats. 60, 30,000. 50,000, 45,000, 45,000, one year private, 70, we have a USC student right up here, USC student, anybody else? 60,000, John, let's hit it one more time, $50,770 is the average, so just shy of $51,000, let's say it out loud, there is some minor as it is, solace, 
an understanding that about $22,000 and about $51,000 is what we could expect to pay annually for schools averaged across the states. But it is not unreasonable that we, as parents and students, should shout out those loftier numbers, right? Many of the schools in your universe, many of the schools that you may be considering applying to, right? We were, we were only joking about the USC uh, being $70,000, there's $79,000 this year, right? And why you in my hometown, $78,000. Uh, uh, Rob and I were talking about this just before, University of Chicago within the next two years will likely top $100,000. So when we think about it, I don't show those numbers to you to scare you. I've been a long time teacher. I want to make sure that before you exit this room tonight, and Mr. Kennerick will do the same, to make sure that you were equipped with the finest and the most actual of data sets so that you can go forward and understand those things and not be intimidated to them as you move on. Okay, I beat this point down. As we said before, biggest fear for students and parents, not just this year, but for seven consecutive years running is taking on too much debt to pay for college, shared between students and parents. But let us look at this number. What is the actual debt, the average, not average, the amount of indebtedness that a student who graduated just in the springtime of 2021, what did they actually graduate with in levels of debt? Shout it out from your seats, I wanna hear it. Two, I'm sorry? Two? Hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand dollars. Anybody else? Hundred and fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. Anyone else? A hundred thousand dollars. John, let's hit that one more time. Twenty-nine thousand four hundred dollars. Folks, again, it is not unreasonable, but we should feel some solace. I think less, I mean, a little more than just minor solace here. Um, but we should understand, without question, that we understand why we might be lofting those or volleying those loftier numbers, right? We understand that wherever we get our news from, we are talking about or reading about or hearing about students that have ballooning debt, $100,000, $200,000. The most crushing stories, and this is where we talk about this often at the Princeton Review, are those students that, and you'll hear these terms over the next year or years as you move forward through the college process, did not succeed. They did not persist. So they do not have an undergraduate degree, a college degree, uh, but they also still have crushing debt. But there is some understanding that we have to understand the averages. $29,400 with the average student. Okay, how about this? The amount of student debt that exists. And folks, before you even shout out an answer for this one, I'm going to tell you this, uh, just a quick hint. This is a cartoonishly large number. What is it? What is, shout it out for me, Steve. What, what, what is the actual amount of student debt that exists? Uh, come on, what? what? $200 million. $1 trillion. That's what I'm talking about. Anybody else? $32 million. $32 billion. Anybody else? $4.5 billion. $250 billion. 120 billion, these are cartoonishly large numbers. But here's the thing, John will hit it one more time. 1.7 trillion dollars. So here's, folks, here's the thing. I don't put these numbers up here to intimidate anyone. And the thing is that when we read or hear uh, stories about ballooning debt, and we will certainly be hearing them certainly over the next couple of months, but that 1.7 trillion dollars is simply not inclusive of just undergraduate, four-year, not-for-profit colleges that many of you will likely end up at. It is also inclusive of every law school, business school, medical school, graduate programs that exist. If we just removed law school, B school, and medical school from that number, it would come down by a minimum of 40%, right? So here's the thing, still a lofty number, without question. But my job, certainly Mr. Kanarek's job tonight, is to make sure that we're diffusing some of the stress and frenzy and making sure that we're giving you good and clear information so that you can go forward being a confident college shopper, you as students and parents be your advisors in that process. Okay. Uh, Absolutely. So the, does, it, does it include, the question was, does it include all fees and, and absolutely, room, board fees, the whole, the whole shebang. Yep, yep. Uh, okay. 
So I was giving a talk earlier this week at Corona Del Mar High School, not too far from here, and I promised that audience that I would force you guys to do the same exercise. And here's the way we set up the exercise. I said that crowd, and I'll say it to you guys tonight. Um, I'm going to tell you two facts around the college admission process that I am convinced you will hear a few other places. First fact, it has never, ever been easier to get into college than it is today. Second fact, it has never, ever been harder to get into college than it is today. <laughs> Who is this admission quack that Mr. Stelmar invited to come and speak to us tonight? Folks, we're going to try to prove out my completely unscientific theory, Allie. We're going to try to prove it out but we're gonna, I'm going to make you work for it. I want every student listening to my voice uh, to take out a piece of paper. You could take out your phone. You could tweet it to me at the Princeton Rev. I care not the platform that you use. Um, but this is not to be graded. But for every student listening to my voice, I want you to write down or type in the names of three colleges or universities that you would love to see yourself as a college freshman with these two caveats. Folks, I don't care if you don't have a prayer in heaven to get into that school academically or $2 saved in the bank to pay for it. So it doesn't matter about academic, academic admission and it doesn't matter about financial aid. Parents, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to channel your son or daughter who's sitting next to you or who you are representing from home and I want you to write down three schools that you would love to see them at as a college freshman. Doesn't matter about academic admission. Doesn't matter about financial aid. Folks, I'm going to give you 27 seconds to write down these schools. Ready? Go, 27 seconds. Any school is fair game, guys. Uh, they could be public or private. They could be large or small. They could be urban, suburban, or rural. Tick tock, tick tock. We have 16, 15 seconds, 14 seconds. We have, uh, these could be international schools. They could be for-profit schools. They could, they could be, <laughs> they could be online schools. Heresy. They could be, um, they could be religious, they could be secular. You're getting my point. Okay, here we go. Uh, three, two, one. Okay, I want you to keep your pens in your hands or your fingers on your phones, and I want you to cross off or erase every school that I name off. You ready? Now, when we did this at, uh, I'll tell you what happens later. I want you to cross off first every Ivy League school. Oh gosh, when we talked about, when we, when we hit the crowd last, uh, on Monday at Corona Del Mar and I said cross off every Ivy League school, the audible groans coming from the audience were cartoonish. Um, but be that as it may, uh, there are only eight Ivies, we all know what they are, Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, uh, you, you get them. Let's move on. Brown, of course. Uh, let's hit a couple of schools here in your home state. We're going to hit the most popular school in the land. 121,000 applications last year. Mr. Kenrick, also a graduate, University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Cross it off your list. Let's cross off Cal, of course, University of California, Berkeley. Let's cross off Stanford, of course. Oh, how could I, how could I even delay? Um, let's cross off Pomona. Let's cross off, let's cross off Loyola Marymount, Mr. Delmar's uh, uh, alma mater. Uh, let's cross off one other California. Oh, UC Santa Barbara. Let's get rid of that one. Anybody else? Oh my gosh, the Trojans. How could I forget? <laughs> USC goes. We don't want to pick on California too much. USC goes. We'll move on from California. Let's hit a couple of schools in the Pacific Northwest. We're going to hit University of Washington and Lewis and Clark. Two schools in Texas. We're going to hit uh, University of Texas at Austin and Rice University. We're going to hit a couple of schools in the Midwest. We're going to hit uh, Northwestern University and University of Chicago. We're going to hit a couple of schools in uh, New York City. We're going to hit a couple of schools. We're going to hit NYU. We're going to, oh, I knew I'd get you. Um, <laughs> And we're gonna hit NYU, we're already at Columbia because it's an Ivy. We will move on from New York City. Let's hit a couple of schools in Boston. Boston College, Boston University, MIT, and Northeastern. Let's go to DC, uh, DC area. We'll hit uh, Georgetown, George Washington, and American. Every time I say a word, you're crossing this off of your list. Um, Georgetown, George Washington, or an American. University of Virginia, a little further south. A couple of schools also in the southeast. Duke, Clemson, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Paul, did I miss one? Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt in Nashville, of course, Vanderbilt. That's about 25. Okay, folks, uh, pens down, hands off your phones. I'd like to see a showing of hands who still 
has three schools on their list. Okay. How about two schools on your list? How about one school on your list? Okay. Folks, we have a problem here. Let us recall our exercise. We said that it has never been easier to get into college than it is today, and it has never been harder to get into college than it is today. You've heard in my opening soliloquy here that there are over 3,000 four-year colleges in the U.S. alone, but folks, it has never been harder to get into college than it is today because we are all applying to the same 25 or 30 schools. <laughs> Here's the thing. We understand, and I often do this exercise with, 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 good, with good, good crowds, but here's the thing. I had the opportunity this past year to ask that same question with the just shy of 15,000 folks that completed this College Helps and Warriors Service. So again, college-bound students and their parents. You guys in your seats just last year. So uh, actually, John, let's take a look. One more, one more hit of that slide. Okay, don't, don't hit it yet again. So we're going to, um, thank you, sir. So here's the, here's the thing. I'm going to reveal the same questions that we talked about with you guys. What would, be, uh, <clears throat> what would be on your dream college list, just three schools, if money and academic admission were not issues? John, let's take a look. One hit. Students are going to say, Harvard, Stanford, and NYU, and their parents said, one more time, John, Stanford, Harvard, and Princeton. What, what a thoughtfully conceived list. <laughs> Folks. We understand that the 45,000 students who applied to Stanford this year, the 4.2% of whom were actually admitted, are superlative students indeed. That said, whether it's the 45,000 students that applied to Stanford, the 121,000 st students that applied to UCLA, I will wager right down to my toes that not every one of those students is a best fit for Stanford or UCLA or any of the schools that I forced you to cross off that list. And I'm just going to say it out loud. Every one of the schools that I forced you to write down or cross, cross off your list, I love those schools. I write a bunch of books about college admissions, specifically about schools. It pains me to cross them off the list. But the point of the exercise and my promise to Mr. Stelmar is that while I had you here for the 45 minutes, that you would exit this room with a wider lens on which schools might be appropriate for me as a student, and to have that conversation with your parents and your families and, of course, your counselors, right? So these schools, I, I, in no way am I demonizing them. These schools are exceptional schools, but there are many exceptional schools out there. Mr. Kanner, can I talk about this many times over? There are 3,000 schools out there, none of which are in the business of educating students poorly, right? Our job, your job, you could call it a challenge, but I call it an opportunity, is to exit this room and then move on, working with your college counselors, to make sure that you're crafting that list of substance based on that ideal of fit. Okay. Uh, John, I, ha I have one comic relief slide for you. Um, some brave soul, we'll just hit it one time, just keep it there for one second, John. Um, I have one comic relief slide for you. Some brave soul out there is going to shout this out from their seat. I'm going to put up a dateline. John is going to put up a dateline next. And it's going to be a, a city, a state, a month, and a year. And some soul out there is going to shout out from their seats to tell me, tell us, why this dateline is so crucial to our modern day understanding of college admission. John, hit it. One more time. There it is. Okay. Cambridge, Massachusetts, September. 1636. Folks, what happened in Cambridge, Mass. in September of 1636? Shout it out. Harvard what? Harvard was founded. Anybody else? We can stop there because you're right. Harvard, Harvard more than found, Harvard invited its first freshman class onto campus in September of 1636. But folks, let us not stop there. Let us look back just a few months before to the fall of 1635. What was the admission team at Harvard looking for in its first glorious and renaissance freshman class? John, just hit it one or, one or two more times. One, time, one more time, sir. OK, we'll stop there. So folks, what were the criteria that Harvard was seeking in that first freshman class? Shout it out. What, what did you think? What did they have to have? You had to be male. As crushing, soul-crushing as that is, that is true. Anything else? You had to be clergy. Anything else? 
Money. You see, again, you wait, the extra beat, and the interesting answers come out. Money. Anything else? High IQ. Yeah, we're hitting some academic stuff here. Anything else? John, let's hit the first one. It might not come out so clearly, so I'll walk you through a character. Specifically, strength of character, grit, perseverance. What obstacles did you have in your young lives at 15, 16, or 17 years old? How did you deal with those challenges? And then obviously, how did that influence your strength of character? John, just one more time, sir. Background. Background, folks, and, and I, I, this is an unapologetically large bucket, uh, but, but Harvard still reports out background. But I suspect many things fit into background. Race, gender, ethnicity, financial wherewithal, religiosity, all of those things likely fit into background. But again, be that as it may, for our discussion tonight, that is simply what Harvard reports out to this day for those nearly 400 years ago. The two academic things that Harvard reports out to this day are the following. John, just one more time, sir. Proficiency in Latin, one more, sir. Proficiency in Greek, love Harvard College admission. One more time, John. Love Harvard College admission. Folks, we need to say this out loud. Whether you were applying to college nearly 400 years ago, or you are applying to college in the next year or years, we need to understand this and say the words out loud. The college admission process in and of itself is a really judgy process. John, one more time. I could easily imagine my mother pulling me alongside and saying, Robert, you're never going to get into Harvard unless you do your Greek homework. But here's the thing. We have to understand, just as humans in this room, and I've been a longtime teacher, as of many of your counselors, and certainly Paul and I, the easiest way to diffuse frenzy and to make a confident student or a confident college shopper is to make sure that we say that we see you and we hear you. Folks, the college process is a nerve-wracking process. That said, we can track all sorts of stress, as you can see here on my eye chart. But John, let's hit that one more time. The college admission process has not changed tectonically through our COVID lens, or certainly over the last years of time, right? You may have seen the Varsity Blues Netflix movie or been talking about that certainly over time as it didn't happen very far from here. Um, but again, we can, I'm happy to discuss that with you should, should you wish. But, but the truth is that the factors and the, the criteria around admission have not changed, right? That said, we have to understand, I call them quantitative factors and qualitative factors. Qual quantitative, just numbers. Qualitative, I think of as those things like character and things, things that are personal to, 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 to students outside of the classroom. Folks, if you take away just a couple of nuggets of information tonight, one of them is this. The most important piece of information that your student, that you as students, will be submitting on your college application, COVID or otherwise, is still always, always going to be your high school transcript. Your high school transcript, and we will never forget this upon, upon exit of this room, is the most weighty and hence the most valuable document in your, in your uh, application because it answers this question, question pardon me, for admission teams from schools large and small. And that question is, did you challenge yourself in high school? Did you challenge yourself with regular level courses or advanced level courses or AP level courses? What were the opportunities that you all had uh, at your, in your school? Did you take advantage of those opportunities? And then obviously, how did you do? What was your GPA? Second, I want to tell you that the SAT and the ACT are going away. But the SAT and the ACT, generally speaking from across the country, are going nowhere. We understand that California is treating this differently with a test-blind admission. We're going to talk about it. But for the majority of the 3,000 schools that I keep referring to nationally, schools are still considering SAT, ACT, AP exam scores are on the rise now more than ever due to COVID. But we, folks, we have to understand that those are valuable for academic admission, for scholarship dollars, for entry into honors programs. We'll talk about those in granular terms. I don't want to crush any, crush any souls here when I talk about that. But again, you have to exit well-schooled and informed on this. Qualitative factors. Folks, this is all the stuff that builds character. This is all the stuff that's human, right? Uh, Ali, you and I grew up in different cities. We went to different high schools. The likelihood that your list of extracurricular activities and my list of extracurricular activities, that they would be dead on even, 
would be slim, right? But the truth is that that's the glory of the process. Your list of extracurricular activities should be as unique as you are and my list as unique as I am. And folks, that's the thing, right? I wouldn't be standing here, certainly Mr. Kanarek or any of your counselors, we would not do this, talk about this stuff all the time if we didn't believe Certainly that there are quantitative metrics in the process of admission, without question. But there are qualitative metrics as well that are equally valuable, right? Uh, Mr. Kendrick's going to be talking to you about your college essay. It is a fabulous presentation, and you will walk away empowered because of that, right? You might be thinking of it as a chore now, but the truth is it's going to be valuable and deeply valuable for you in the college process as well. Also, I tell my own students this all the time. We will not unlearn what we've learned over the last year and a half plus of time during COVID. And some of those things are very good. And one of them, last on my list here, your interview. Folks, because of COVID, we understand that college admission teams have had to tectonically change the way they talk and build relationships and ultimately recruit students, right? And here's the thing, that means in this regard, that more and more students are able to interview, virtual as it is, sometimes in person, but more and more students are able to interview due to COVID's impact than ever before. And folks, if you take away just another bit of information tonight, one of them is this. If you have the opportunity to interview, we will never, ever, upon exit of this room, let that opportunity go unrealized, right? Because, sir, what is your name? Joseph. So Joseph, if you are able to sit down, virtual or otherwise, with whoever that anointed person is from the admission office, and Joseph, you're able to say, I've done my research. I think that I've found fit in myself, in your school, based on that research. And Joseph, if you're able to do that, first of all, well done, because for a young person to serve up that conversation, what it means is that you're serving up a conversation of substance. And you're being able, you're, you're hoping to build a relationship with that admission counselor or the admission team or whoever you're having that conversation with. And that is a powerful, powerful lever for a young person to pull and the thing is, it is incredibly valuable in the process as we move forward. Uh, I'm gonna get off my soapbox here. John, let's look at the next slide. Okay. Am I completely blowing past my time, Rob? You just tell me, you just tell me, uh, you just give me the five minute warning, okay? Okay, great. Um, folks, questions that you undoubtedly have. I'm sure you were talking to your counselors here at Brea about on the daily, right? How is test optional going to affect my strategy moving forward? Should I actually still take the SAT or ACT? How important are AP exams? Is there going to be any money left after COVID actually crests? Um, what does that mean for us as we move forward? John, let's take a look at the next slide, sir. Okay, a lot of, lot of words on this slide. Gosh, I hate this. But, but, but here's the thing. Um, I, I get, you don't have to read this whole thing, but I'm just going to give you the sense of it. We did a survey this summer middle of summer, 300 college administrators, I write a book called The Best 387 Colleges, 300 of the schools in there got back to us with all sorts of uh, things of what they were doing around their reopening plans in fall of 2021, were you we going to require a mask, did everybody have to be vaccinated, this doesn't matter to you. What does matter to you are two things here, enrollments and the value of the SAT and ACT. Enrollments, we're just going to talk about that for two seconds, right? Not surprising to anybody in this room, in fall of 2020, last year, schools, many, many, many schools across the country, public and private, cratered. They had far less students on their campus than they ever had in years past. Now, that was split fairly unevenly between public and private schools. More and more students were price sensitive, so they went to public schools instead of private schools. That is changing, right? More schools in 2021, this fall, this, this current fall, are ratcheting up, they're seeing more students. That, that will likely continue. And that's good news for us in this room. The SAT and the ACT. Out of those 300 schools, and I'm collecting this data, I wish I had more data to show you, but I'm collecting this data, 87% of the 300 colleges that we had surveyed were test optional. But that same 87% said that if you submit your SAT and ACT scores, we'll consider them for admission. So I, I am, the, I am not a fan of the SAT and ACT. The only thing those tests test is how well you perform on them, right? It's not a question of how smart you are. It's a question of how well you take that particular exam. But the truth is that exam is valuable. 
It is valuable for those schools, and in a year of great, or a year and a half now of great change, when so many things were taken away from you in the springtime of 2020, right? Your classes went from all in-person to completely uh, uh, online. Your grades likely went from letter or number grade generated to completely pass fail, at least in the spring semester. Your activities were all likely just you know, completely canceled or curtailed significantly. Your work outside the classroom was likely canceled as well. In a year of great change, I can see this in no other way, backed up by this data, that the SAT and ACT give us a way to differentiate ourselves. Imperfect as it is, I'm not here to judge. But what I am here to do is to explain how schools are considering this. Now, I have three slides, this next, next three, and again, I, I, I'm going to break my own rule and read these to you. John, let's just take a look, just hit it one more time. So I'm gonna, we have three schools that I picked from across the country, all of whom are uh, using test optional admission or te using test optional strategy in different ways, right? Due to COVID's impact. Scripps, you guys know this, the, one of the, the five Claremont colleges, Scripps, Pomona, Pitzer, Claremont McKenna, Harvey Mudd. Uh, Scripps has said, John, just one more time, sir, that they are gonna become permanently test optional. Just one more time, sir, I'm gonna read this one to you. Here's what Scripps admission team has said about test optional admission. The policy to remove the requirement of submitting SAT or ACT scores will allow admission officers to identify and advocate for students with a strong academic profile who may have previously been viewed as less competitive based on their performance on a single exam. You know what I have to say to this? Bully for you, Scripps. This is awesome, right? We understand that Scripps is in our corner and says, you know, you're not judged by one exam. However, Scripps is one of the schools, those 300 schools that 87% of them said that if you submit your scores, we'll still consider them, but you're not obliged. John, one more time, sir. Tufts, 12 miles outside of Boston, outside of downtown Boston. They have embraced, one more time, sir, a three-year test optional admission policy. So if you're seniors in this room, you're still gonna get in under this. So this extends through the fall of 2022, those students that matriculate in the fall of this year, of next year, pardon me. And here's what Tufts has said. Just one more time, sir. We believe this policy provides students with maximum flexibility. If applicants would like us to consider their exam results as one component of their candidacy, we will do so in a nuanced and contextual way. If students choose not to submit their exam results, we'll evaluate their candidacy on a nuance, in a nuanced and contextual way without scores. Folks, I'm just gonna wear my editor-in-chief hat at the Princeton Review, a little redundant on the uh, nuance and contextual. But again, be that as it may, what Scripps is saying, I mean, what uh, Tufts is saying is that submit your scores if you want to, don't submit them if you don't, we're gonna evaluate you the same way. I have one more school, one Ivy. Let's look at it one more time, sir. Uh, Cornell very reluctantly, just one more time, John. One more, uh, uh, so uh, Cornell said it was gonna embrace, when COVID first took hold, a one-year test optional policy, and then it moved it reluctantly to two years, and now for three years, fall of 2022. Here's what they said, just one, one more time, John. We anticipate that many students who will have had reasonable and uninterrupted opportunities to take the ACT and or SAT during 2020-21 administrations will continue to submit results, and those results will continue to demonstrate preparation for college-level work. Folks, I'm just going to say this out loud. This doesn't feel like a bear hug of a embrace of test optional admissions at Cornell. What it says is that if you have the ability to take the SAT or ACT scores, you better take it, right? I am doing this. I'm just highlighting these things because it is truly the Wild West out there when it comes to test optional admission. The other thing is, this is Cornell's re-edited statement. Their first one was so god-awful that it scared more students and parents than it ought to. But, but again, we're gonna believe that, be that as it may, Cornell is clear in what his intentions are here as well. We understand that through COVID, things will continue to change. There's some positives, there's some negatives. But again, my job, Mr. Stelmar's job, certainly Mr. Kanarak's job as well, is to make sure that we're diffusing some of the myth out there and making sure that we, we narrow down the process. Okay, one more time, uh, John. A lot of words on this page. I'm just gonna summarize it in one second. AP exams are on the rise. In 2019, 5.2 million administrations 
of the AP exams, the 38 AP exams actually happened. I say 5.2 million administrations because most students usually take multiple exams. So it's not just 5.2 million students, but, but, but you get my, my drift. That same year, the College Board, who creates all those 38 AP exams, also creates the SAT, and 2.2 million students in 2019 were able to take the SAT. So again, we understand that the numbers are dwarfed, and during COVID, more and more students were able to take the AP exams because you could take them at home, you could take them online. First of all, 45-minute incarnation, last year a three-plus-hour incarnation. But one thing that is actually going back is unlearning what we learned over the last year and a half are your AP exams. So if you're taking AP exams in the springtime of this year, they will go right back to the way they were in 2019, right? Three hour plus exams, completely pencil and paper, save for the Japanese and Chinese exams that you can take online, but everything else will go back. Okay, I can talk to you about that all night long. We're gonna, we're gonna move on from this one, sir, uh, John. Okay. And you're gonna give me the five minute warning, Rob? 23 minutes left, oh great, I'm, I'm speeding through this, okay great. Um, here's the thing, we asked in this College Hopes and Worries survey, again, what were the factors that are most likely, what were the deciding factors around college, around college admission? And here's where I am heartened in thinking about college admission. Students and parents are saying that it's all about fit, right? It's about fit, it's about career services, it's about things that are going to be of value to me and not simply uh, brand and perception. We understand this stuff. John, we'll take a look one more time, sir. I write this book for Princeton Review, and I put this entire book online for free, so I don't wish for you to buy it. I mean, you can buy it if you want to. But uh, this is my completely self-serving slide. This book does not make me, and actually, it actively makes me disliked on college campuses across the country. And I'm wondering if anybody can, can tell me why. I put up, why is this book different? Does anybody know? why I am really one of the most despised persons on college and from college admission offices and chancellor's offices and presidents. Anybody know why? Because they're not in it. I like that one. Anything? Say again. There's, there's 3,000 colleges in there. They didn't make the cut. I like that. Although my, my mother to this day denies this, I'm the guy that writes the party school list each year. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ranking lists galore. Um, and, and here's the thing, this doesn't make me incredibly popular with uh, senior administrators that get on less than coveted ranking lists. Uh, but the thing is, that's not my audience. My audience is right here. Students, parents, and counselors helping them along the way. And when I think about this stuff, um, I think I know a lot about schools, doesn't matter a whit what I think specifically. The difference between this book, and John, maybe we'll just hit it one more time, sir. Um, is that I yield completely to whom I consider college experts of their own experiences, and that's not me. These are current college students, right? Now I'm in a unique position to ask those students questions about their experiences academically or otherwise. So, in this service of finding fit, I ask students, are your professors good teachers? Uh, do your professors during their lectures bring the material in class to life or do your professors suck all of the life out of the material that they teach in class? Folks, this does not make me incredibly popular on college campuses, again, when they get on less than coveted lists. But here's the thing, and John will look at it one more time, just click one more time. Um, here's the thing, I do a lot of ranking lists and I hate to be self-serving in this, in this regard. I am very proud of these, these rankings because they are in the service of what Mr. Stelmar asked me to talk about tonight, which is finding a school that's the best fit for you. Folks, another one of the nuggets that you must, must take away tonight is that you have to find out as much as possible about student opinion, right? And, and, and that means, and you guys are all such primary sources here, because if you can start following schools on social, I'm not talking about the admission teams at schools, but you could choose to do that, but you have an unbelievable opportunity to use a platform that you know and know, and know well to be able to start to build relations with individuals at schools, even more importantly than that, understand what students do at particular schools, academically and otherwise. And this is of incredible value when we're starting to think about fit. Uh, we do a good service of this, but again, you have the opportunity here to do the same thing. Um, John, let's take one more, one more look. Okay. I have been asked this question 
is college worth it? More times over the last four years than over the last 28 years that I've been talking about higher ed, right? And, and, and here's the thing, I'm the editor-in-chief of the Prince Review. Spoiler alert, I think college is worth it. But the truth is that students and parents are saying yes. 99% of them say yes, college is worth it. But it is worth it for specific reasons, right? Biggest piece of the pie, as you can see here just as well as I can, is a better job and a higher income, right? If this is you, you are likely asking or noodling around this question of what is going to be the return on my investment, academic investment if I'm a student, and what is going to be the return on my financial investment if I'm a student and a family, a parent, right? And if you're asking that question, it is not taboo. You should be asking that question, and you should be asking it now, right? This is not something that we should kick off until, oh, I'll worry about it after I'm admitted, and I'll think about it after, you know, after another bit of time. You're coming to the table tonight, and I'm so pleased that you are here, but you're coming to the table tonight for a conversation of substance around fit, and this is one of them, right? This is one of the things that you have to exit remembering. That nothing that we have rolling around in our noggins, particularly around the value of college, is ever going to be taboo. Um, probably Mr. Kanerick and I are probably two of the, of, of the people that on the planet that visit more colleges than any other human. And we have a low tolerance for if we're not hearing in the first three or four minutes when we're on campus about this idea of career services. What are students doing, not only academically, but how are they engaging outside the classroom, not in just senior year, but freshman year through senior year? John, let's just take a look at that next slide. Um, okay, uh, we, we could hold it there. Um, that idea of career services and career centers, you'll hear different nomenclature used here. The idea of internships or externships or experiential learning, and they'll mean the same thing. It means what are you doing outside the classroom that complements what you're doing inside the classroom from freshman year through senior year. And folks, that is a powerful thing, right? For parents in this room that might have gone to college 20 or 25 years ago or whatever it is, it would have been very hard for us to have that kind of conversation. But it's not hard for students in this room. And the thing is, schools worth their weight will be talking to you about it aggressively as you start to visit campus virtually or otherwise. And I think that that is awesome. Um, I, I put up, you know, if you're nervous about money, as we talked about before, Will there actually be any financial aid for me if I'm applying to college this year or in the next couple of years? And the answer is yes. $187 billion, that's a lot of money uh, doled out annually. Um, and this is certainly from federal money and from state money. But again, we have to feel that we are, there's no pox on us if we are engaging in that financial aid process. 85% of all students across the country receive some sort of financial aid. We have to understand this. We understand that 50% of it, as you can see here, will come from the federal government and the state government, but 40% will come from the schools themselves, the schools that you're applying to, right? So I'm gonna end with this. Nationally, students will apply to, on average, seven schools, right? You have an unbelievable opportunity to make sure that that list of seven or nine or 10 or whatever it is that you apply to are going to be ideal fits for you. And I'm just gonna share you this one last anecdote and then I'm gonna get off the stage. Uh, we work at Princeton Review with 1.4 million students, and college bound students annually. That's one out of every two kids that applies to college each year. I take that number very seriously, I'm grateful for it. But we see those students making mistakes early on in the process in crafting that list of schools that they're gonna to apply to. And I'm just gonna share with you the four biggest mistakes that students make that I've seen. I know this is never gonna happen with any students in this room, so I'm just gonna say it out loud. The first biggest mistake that our students at the Princeton Review have made over the last several years, applying to a school because my boyfriend or girlfriend decided to go to that school. I know it's not gonna happen here at Brea, but I'm just gonna say it out loud. Nationally, this does happen. Number two. Applying to a school because everybody from my high school normally applies to that school. How about this one? Applying to a school because it is easy to get into. And the fourth one, applying to a school because it is hard to get into. Folks, 
Here's the thing. If you take one last nugget away from my comments tonight, it is this. For those seven schools that you, or nine schools that you will apply to in the next year or years, your opportunity, your challenge, is to be delighted, would to feel delighted, to actually be admitted and to enroll in any of them, right? As we said before, 3,000 schools out there, none of which are in the business of educating students poorly. Your job is to make sure that you're bear-hugging yourself in the data that we're talking about around fit, including student opinion, and making that choice in a good way based on that data set. I'm here to help you. My contact information is there. I do a YouTube channel. Actually, th I, John, that's, I think that's my last slide. Uh, yeah, so if you, if you didn't get tired of hearing me talk, I, I do a big YouTube channel on, on Princeton Review. But folks, thank you. You're a very kind audience. I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much. We take questions now? Yes, questions now uh, uh, for me, and then we'll, in the back. What's the average student aid package given to students? Here's the thing. We can look at this number in a couple ways. I want to give you a real answer. Um, I will include a service that we use. That it's a free. It's just a bunch of this is what I geek out and do all the time is look at what the average aid package is for first year students and then sophomores through seniors for several thousand schools across the country. So it's, it's difficult for me to say between public and private schools what that number is because it varies for different schools. But you are very right to ask that question. And, and that's stuff that you know, we might have a couple years ago just said, oh, we'll worry about the money later. But the truth is, if you're asking those things now, if a school has financial wherewithal, and they're also making that, fi that, those, that finance um, treasure trove valuable to a student, a freshman through a senior, then that's the work that we should be doing. And I highlight this. So the thing is called Best Value Colleges. You could look it up on our website, but I will send you a link to it tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, yeah. So it's, it's that, that's it. That's it. Good question. Anybody else? Allie, nothing? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, sir. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah, yeah. What's a good thing? Uh, how, what's a good way, strategy to figure out if a school is actually going to be a best fit for you? Um, here's the thing. I, I do this. I write this book for a long time. Called, it's an annual edition called "The Best 387 Colleges." I go back to this because it's an absolutely free resource. You could buy the phone book size publication if you want. I know I'm dating myself with that term, but um, but you could just look it up online. Here's the thing. I would pick the three schools that you had on your list, or just three schools and read the profile, because this isn't my opinion. It's the opinion of, I surveyed this past year, 154,000 students about, uh, across these 387 schools, and many, many more on our website. So you can look up nearly, I, I suspect, many schools in your universe. And you read about what students are saying about their academic experience, about their life outside the classroom, about their experience with administrators on campus, and then what they're doing after graduation. You will undoubtedly say that, you know, University of Redlands, which is an awesome school, uh, you could say, gosh, you know, I could see myself. It sounds like me. Or when you go to the Vassar profile, you're like, no, it doesn't sound like me at all. But here's the thing. If you start to feel that way about one particular, or several schools, I have nine schools that match with that school. So if you're looking at Vassar, and you're like, gosh, it really does sound pretty good to me, then you have three schools that Vassar students would likely apply to as well, and they would likely go there. Some schools that they would be dead even in thinking about Vassar, and then some schools that a Vassar student, if admitted, likely wouldn't go to. But then I encourage you to just read those other nine profiles. It takes some time, Joseph, I appreciate that. But as you go through, you become a primary source because you start to hear and read things about the academic experience and otherwise that will likely speak to you. And, and that is the only way that I know how to go about the process. It's a longer process, but the truth is we always have schools kind of rolling around in our heads. We went through that exercise. Brand and perception exist, right? But we're all smart enough in this room to say, Really what matters is fit, right? And, 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 and that we saw in our survey, and I suspect you guys are the same. So that means that, you know, we're human. Brand and perception, I get it. But the truth is that we can likely have a larger, uh, wider lens in that regard. And that's the way I go about it. Good question. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Ah, uh, yeah. So how important is your undergraduate college selection in getting into medical school? There is, uh, this is quantitative data, right? So we understand 
that the answer is it is important, but the answer is, also is, is, is important based on your academic experience and the value and your GPA, your overall GPA, in moving on to medical school specifically. So it, it doesn't mean that small schools in the Midwest uh, that we might not have heard of before tonight uh, are, should be lesser in our eyes in moving on to medical school. So there are two things that I would think about. One, you have to be a superlative student in college. That, that's a given, no matter what school that you go to. And then you can very, very clearly find out, and this is a service that we provide at Princeton Review, and but many other people provide it as well, or individual schools will tell you, what is their placement rate for those schools into medical school? That, so it's a quantitative uh, analysis, you know, and, and uh, but that paired with fit. I was giving a talk at this school called Washington and Jefferson School, uh, Washington and Jefferson College, little school in, outside of Pittsburgh, wonderful school, 1,800 students. It has a huge placement into medical schools, but it's off the radar for so many people because it's, it's relatively small. It's a great school, but it has such a, an amazing placement rate into medical school, and that's the stuff that those numbers, those, those statistics will simply bear out. Yeah, good question. Anything else? I'm going to seed the stage if we don't have another one. Folks, my contact information is all over this thing. I'm going to make sure uh, I stay in contact. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to Mr. Kenrick's comments. Yeah. Um, and Paul's going to talk about the college essay, and I'm going to turn it over to Paul. It has been, I think, 15 years since Rob and I shared a, a speaking podium. Um, I don't think you guys know how famous he actually is in our field. He is the person sort of every television station goes to, every media outlet goes to. Um, his origin story, and I wish Rob was here to hear it because he would enjoy it because he experienced it. His origin story was that Rob, I think, was 24 years old when he came to work at Princeton Review. And the person who did all of the media for Princeton Review at the time was sort of the chairperson, John Katzman. And John had been asked to go on ABC's Good Morning America to talk about something. I, for the life of me, I couldn't remember it. And he came down with an absolute awful cold and had laryngitis. And so he came in and he croaked in the office and he pointed at Rob and Rob was the only person available. And Rob had been in the company for 10 minutes, <laughs> right? And he pointed to Rob and he said, Rob, you need to go down to ABC TV. You need to be on Good Morning America. I need you to do it. You're going to be great. You're going to be fantastic. Just here, here, borrow my tie. Go on down. Now, Rob has at the time zero television experience and at the time maybe four minutes of experience within the Princeton Review, right? So Rob gets in the taxi, goes down there, and just before he leaves, John comes up to Rob and throws his arms around him and sort of says, and don't you dare screw this up, and sends him on his way. And ever since that time, Rob has been the face of Princeton Review worldwide because he was such a natural, we never let John go back on television again. Um, and you haven't lost the touch, my friend. It is still an absolute delight to see you operate. Um, I want to sort of move forward with something that Rob hit relentlessly, which was this notion that this journey that you are on is ordained by you, is governed by you, and is centered in you. And it really doesn't have to be about the name brand of a university. Um, and the story I'm about to share with you, I think I'm stealing from Rob himself. I think I heard it from him first. But imagine your freshman year at Braille, and if I had walked in and I had said, listen, here's the promise. If you show up, you get B's and C's, and you graduate, I can promise you, you will get into one of the top 150 colleges in America. You would have been somewhat surprised at that statement. And by the way, it is a true statement. If you are a high school graduate with a GPA of over like a 2.5 and you apply to Kansas State University, which is ranked 149th in the country, their admit rate is 99.5%. So here is a highly ranked college that pretty much takes everyone. Why? Because they're in Kansas. And people in California and around the world don't wake up and say, today's a good day. Today's the day I choose to apply to Oklahoma. And there's a lesson there. 
the more you sort of stretch into places in college that you might not normally choose to visit, the more the admit rates go up, the more the outcomes are improved, and as Rob sort of said so eloquently and so consistently, the less money you will pay. A flagship university of a state always carries the largest number of resources. The University of Oklahoma is a flagship campus. The University of Arkansas is a flagship campus. The University of West Virginia, which I swear is in America, is a flagship campus. I recently learned there's not one, but in fact two Dakotas, and they each will have a flagship campus. And for us out of hand to reject them because we haven't heard of them, that seems to me to be bad process and bad financial management. My God, you don't think they would love a kid from Southern California somewhere in Arkansas? <laughs> now, I'm not saying you should be a Razorback. I'm not saying you should go to their football stadium where the cheer is in tens of thousands of voices, woo, pig, suey, that actually happens, and it's oddly compelling, right? But I am saying to, consider, to, to just disregard it out of hand, that's not you being the wisest consumer, that's not you being the most open-minded, and that's you sort of just following lemmings off a cliff. And that message that Rob preaches so eloquently is the one I wanted to reinforce at the start here. My God, you're going to have choices. Final note on this. If you're a student with a 3.0 GPA who never bothered to take the SAT and whose extracurricular activity list is stuff I did, and you were to apply to 3,000 colleges in America, you would get into probably more than 2,600 of them. You'd probably get money from about 1,000. It's not that daunting, is it? It's the flip side of what Rob taught earlier. It's never been harder to get into college in America, true statement around those 25 schools. But look at the other side. My 3.0 kid who hadn't done much, she will have 2,600 choices. And that is the magic and the glory that you have waiting for you as you go through this journey. And that is a word I use deliberately. Process, to me, is painful. No one wakes up in the day and gets excited about process. Process is a bank loan. Process is a particularly tasty food that isn't good for you. Process is not joyful, but journeys are. Journeys are interesting. Journeys take you places. They're not always easy and they have to be planned. But this thing you're about to embark on is a journey and the itinerary and the number of stops is as broad and as neat as you want them to be. And that is the beginning of this particular presentation as we flow into the second question that colleges will ask you. Do you remember the first question? Because Rob taught it to you. What's the first question every college will ask? GPA was a symptom of it. The question, have you challenged yourself in school? But I'll make it even more basal. Are you smart enough to do well here? That is the first question. And it's an objective question because it can be answered by the classes that you took, the test scores that you managed, your AP test results, if applicable, and the grades that you got. It's objective. It's on a transcript. In the workplace, it would be called your resume. Can you do the job we are hiring for? Well, the challenge for competitive colleges is that the answer for almost all of their applicants is yes. So when uh, Rob was talking about the 45,000 people who applied to Stanford, and they took about 1,800 of them, there were 25 or 30,000 other students where the answer was, this kid is more than smart enough to do well here. She's got the academic chops, but we didn't admit her because the second question, do we like you? Now, this is annoying 
because I just moved from the objective, the numerical, the quantitative, right? I, got, I went from a meritorious construct to something incredibly subjective. What do you mean, do you like me? Like I care. I have five fives on my APs. Like that. But to come back to the work analogy, the first question a job asks is, can you do the job? But once they've determined that you are a qualified candidate, what's the next thing they normally do? Well, normally they interview you. And who do you think they hire? Who do you hire? The person you like. The person who fits. The person who seems good culturally. So even in work, which has a completely objective underpinning, the resume, you almost always hire to the question, did we like you? And colleges are exactly the same way. And the more competitive the college, the more likely they are to ask the question, do we like you? And there's only really three ways to determine if I like you. How do you spend your time, your extracurricular activities, and Rob has written books about this and done YouTube videos about this, and I need not to bore you with this, because he can do that. Yep. <laughs> Rob, it is so good to be in a theater with you again, my friend. It's just a cool moment for me. Um, another one is the interviews, and guess what? Rob talks about that too, but my topic is the essays. How do you choose to talk about yourself? And with that in mind, John, next slide, please. Um, various applications, this is where you can find them, and as Rob pointed out, we'll send these things to you. You don't have to take pictures of, of pictures that you'll never look at again. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about the University of California, because we're in it. For years, the University of California had 14 criteria by which they would evaluate you. And you can see they got rid of one of them. Right? So now they have 13 criteria by which they evaluate you, and you'll notice increasingly as you flow through these criteria, you move from the objective to the subjective. And these are the pieces that they are looking at within the UC system. And thus your activities will matter to them, and your answers to the four picks, the picks, P-I-Q, uh, personal inventory questions. That's some of the things we're going to talk about today. And I just want you to get a sense of this is how they evaluate your application within a UC school. Any questions thus far? We're rolling. We're good. Feel free to interrupt at any time. I do enjoy that. Next slide, please. And here, as you can see, are how the UC schools run their personal, their personal inventory questions, right? Um, there are eight prompts. You have to respond to four of them. And the people at the UC schools don't care at all which four you pick. It's not as though they go, well, you picked two, four, six, eight, so you are lame. But you went one, three, five, seven, thus understand the joy of prime numbers, and you are a person we must have here. That does not actually occur. You pick the pieces where you can tell your best story your best way. Um, <laughs> 350 words in the response. Rob, what percentage of those responses in your experience as a college reader will come between 346 and 350 words? Yeah, it's like unity, isn't it? Like people are committed to hitting 350 words. It's up to. This is not an English assignment. If you've got a good story to tell, and you can tell a good story in 250 words, oh my God, I will love you. I haven't seen that since a week ago Thursday. Bloat only if you have a story to tell. Otherwise, Get in, get out, tell your story, move on. Do I want seven words like a fortune cookie? No, but I don't want you to think that somehow this is a, 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 a rule cast in, in stone. Um, and the final point here is what's a good analogy? Bats cannot see. What they do is they emit sound the sound waves come back to them almost like sonar 
And within those sound waves, they get a pretty good outline of the picture in front of them. It's not perfect. It's not detailed. I'm not exactly sure because they don't speak bat. But in general, they get sort of this overarching idea in three dimensions of what's in front of them. And that is the function of these four answers. Each is a sonar ping. What am I learning about the object in front of me? What story is he telling? What tales has she revealed? What aspect of their personality is flowing through? And you really want to talk about four different things that reveal the pieces of your persona that, that you want them to know, see, and understand. You generally don't tell the same story four different ways because that's boring. But to meet you in four different venues, that's a lot of fun. So I'm going to stop again. Does this kind of make sense? This is really all they're doing. Now, essay writing is impeded by three very powerful factors. The first is your education. The second is your fear. And the third is your DNA contributors, your parents. And I want to take them one at a time. So the first thing, your education. What have you done all your writing for? Who has always been your audience here? Your teachers. And you see them every day. And you know what Mr. Stelmar wants to see, because over the year of painful trial and error, he has shown you what works and what doesn't. And God forbid if you fail to pair, but also with not only, because Armageddon will be visited upon thee. Or the magic words of thesis and theme and topic sentences, and I have relentlessly trained you to speak in the third person objective voice to get a grade from me, a 61 year old white guy. That's how I've trained you, relentlessly. Now you come to college, where you may or may not know that the person reading your essay is going to be in their early 20s. 22, 23, 24. Where you may or may not know that the person reading your essay almost certainly went to the college you are applying to and is viewing your essays through the lens of would I want this person as my roommate. Right? Different essay. Different voice. You are writing to yourself seven years from now. That's the audience, right? So you have to kind of unlearn the way you've been taught to write here. Because the best essays, they're personal reveals, they're diary entries, they're things that show me you. I'm not looking for grammatical perfection backed up with sort of strong data points. I just want to meet you. So that's the first thing you have to unlearn. The second challenge is fear. Oh my God, what if this isn't big? What if I'm not talking about something massive? What if I didn't reinvent a proton? Like, what am I going to do? I, I mean, yesterday I think I managed to make lunch. And sort of this belief that the story you tell, whether it's to the UC system in 350 words times four, or the common app statement at 650 words, this fear is, if I don't tell something broad and magnificent about me, why are they ever going to consider me? And so here's the beauty. Well, first of all, most college essays are just terrible. They're awful. You have no idea how bad they are. And secondly, the best college essays are about the small things. Small, not big. Um, my favorite college essay was actually written by a kid who attended the school, Rob, that you spoke at on Monday, Corona Del Mar High School. Here was his opening line. I am the very worst soccer player on my team. In two years, I have played four minutes. Now, he's not bragging. I mean, very clearly, that is not on display here. And then he sort of talked about how he and his family had lived in England for a while, 
And so, and his dad and he had bonded over watching English soccer and he really enjoyed it. And when he came back to America, he knew he wasn't very good, but he wanted to keep playing this sport that he had connected to, so he joined the high school team. It's a story. And here's how he ended it. Do you know how I knew when I really sucked at soccer? When I won most improved player two years in a row. <laughs> now, how do you not love that guy? Although the story is, I never played a sport that I was bad at. And I was so bad that the coaches took pity on me and named me most improved player twice. That's how bad I was. But anyone sitting reading that, who have they just met? They've met a kid who has a sense of perspective. They've met a kid with a decent sense of humor. And they've met a kid who understands that the journey is the journey. That the result is nowhere near as important as just sort of putting your foot on the road. And that's what the great essays are. And for parents, and again, we get to date ourselves. You guys remember Seinfeld, right? Seinfeld had no plot. It was 22 minutes on the deli. And the great college essays, they don't have plot. They have feeling. They're not about greatness in terms of scope. They're about greatness in terms of authenticity, which leads me to the third thing. Never, ever, ever let your parents read your college essay. <laughs> ever. And what you just did is just a given, because like, I told you time and again, Back off, and now this guy, who's even older than you are, is saying the same thing. But I gotta give a reason, so I don't get like in trouble with you. So mom, dad, you love your child. That means you're a terrible editor. Because you'll do one of two things. You'll say, darling, this is wonderful, and believe me, it isn't. Or, let's say the kid writes down, my funnest year at Brea Linda was my junior year. And here's dad. Funnest is not a word. Funnest isn't even, they're not going to take you into college if you write fun. Give me the pen. My funnest year in high school was my junior year. Here comes dad. The apotheosis of my high school experience was my penultimate anim. Because there is no creature on God's green earth who writes in as constipated a style as a 44-year-old father of a 16-year-old daughter. And I can smell the stench of dad's writing in the first two sentences. And you don't mean to do it. You think you're being helpful, but you're not. Because she's writing to herself. She's not writing to you anymore. And so you take the combination of fear and you take the combination of parents and what do you lose? You lose authenticity, the most important thing. You lose voice, the most important thing. And I think the other thing, and this is more subtle and nuanced, students write different essays when they know their parents are going to see them because they never want to disappoint you and they never want to hurt you or maybe there's things they've done that they don't want you to know about. So then they begin to self-edit before you edit them. Does that make sense? So show your essays, ladies and gentlemen, to someone who does not love you. <laughs> and show them to someone where you can say, well, one, if this grammar's horrible, help me. But here's the most important question. Do you see me here? Or do you see me trying desperately to be somebody else? Voice. So, I've done this long enough that I remember the Stanford essay from 20 years ago. And Stanford stopped using this essay because it was hopeless at revealing anything about students. So here was the Stanford essay. You are going to be stranded on a desert island for the rest of your life. Happy thoughts. You can take two books with you. What would they be and why? Now, this is Stanford. Stanford, you know. Emphasis on the wrong syllable. And let's pretend that you really, 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 really want to go there and dress like a tree. So Stanford beckons. 
You care about it. Two books, Desert Island, rest of your life. What two books would you take and why? And think about what I said. You're educated. There's fear. And there's parental influence. So it will not surprise you to learn that the number one book that students quoted was the Bible. Again and again and again, they would quote the Bible. My favorite was the number three answer. The number three answer was the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> now, you can tell what's happening here. You can hear the noises of... The Please take me, I am so erudite, but could you imagine her as your roommate? You wander in and she's like, I'm on the letter L! Lycanthropy is a great word, work with me. You'd run screaming into the night. And number two was the complete works of William Shakespeare. Oh please, God, no! They stopped using the essay, because they just weren't learning anything. I will tell you. My favorite ever answer to that question was at a speech and there was an older Asian lady in the front row and she says, I take how to get off Desert Island. <laughs> but imagine if you had the courage to write that and write it well. Um, it's so hard doing this with you to remember where my stories begin and Rob's stories end, and vice versa, and wh what we have borrowed from one another. But I'm pretty sure the story I'm about to tell you was told to me by Rob. Rob's predecessor was a man by the name of, I think it was Ed Custard. And he was very big at NYU, and in particular, he was very big within the film school. And it's impossible to get into NYU's film school. Like, you have to give a body part. Here's a kidney, take me. Nah. Kidneys, you have two of those. Give us a liver, we'll think about it, right? And he told this story about this essay that he got from a kid in Maine. And he'd written the essay. That's how old the story is. He'd written the essay. And he was talking about the cinematographic technique of obscure Italian photographers. Now, run that sentence around in your head and realize, I don't want to read it anymore. But the kid's gone on for four pages, and he's talking about these really weird light fixture and aperture things. And it's like 11 o'clock at night for Ed, and Ed is getting more and more annoyed with this kid. He now actively hates this child he has never met. And he gets to page five, and the kid has stopped writing, and he's written in crayon. I don't know who you are or what you want from me. I just know I've got to get the hell out of Maine. <laughs> and Ed started laughing. And the way he tells the story is he calls the kid. And he said, what were you trying to do? And the kid said, I was trying to annoy you so much that you'd laugh at the end of my essay. And he goes, it works. Come and meet me. Because the kid played the game perfectly. He understood his audience, and he hit the right note at the right time. I'm not suggesting you write really boring essays in crayon. It's a moment in time that you can use. Next slide, please. All right. You got three people. You get to pick a roommate. We've got Tony, we've got Lisa, we've got Daniel. Next slide, please. Here's what Tony wrote. Is there anything bad about this essay? I think it's perfectly functional. I think it articulates clearly what he has accomplished. I think there is a certain sense of pride. I think it is crisp. I think it is reasonably well written. There is nothing wrong with this essay. But remember my rules. Who gets to be your roommate? So this is Tony. Next one, please.
again, I think this is a perfectly reasonably well-written statement. I mean, she wants to hang out with grandma. She wants to help. She wants to reach out. So the first kid is active in student government and takes pride in it. The second kid is really interested in volunteerism and takes pride in it. There's nothing bad happening here. But remember, I'm moving from the land of the objective to the land of the subjective. So we will vote at the end here whether you want Tony as your roommate, whether you want Lisa as your roommate, or whether you want the next person as your roommate. And the vote will, everyone will vote for something, but we'll sort of see how it's this subjective universe works. Do the third one, please. Next slide. Well, that's another well-written essay. Not about student government, not about volunteerism, it's about a guy who can't make pancakes. Now, the first one, Tony, student government, who wants Tony as their roommate? There's no wrong answer here. Tony, one person likes Tony. Um, Lisa, who likes Lisa? We got three or four people, five people who like Lisa. And the last one, pancake guy. Pancake guy is the most popular. Thank you. But three very well-written essays. But if you bring your education to bear, you might be afraid to write this last one. What do you mean talking about making lousy pancakes? Who would want you to talk about... You write about making lousy pancakes? I, like, I'm going to disown you. You're going to be in the garage with the dog eating kibble. We don't talk about making bad pancakes in our application to Vanderbilt. And yet, really, it's so much about do we like you and what is maddening about well, do we like you is that you liked the first guy, a bunch of people like the second guy, and a bunch of people like the third person. So it's an inexact science, which is why your voice matters so much. Next slide, please. Um, please don't write one of these. They're painful for us to read. They are the quintessential five-paragraph essay that you mail in to your U.S. history teacher when you only had eight minutes to finish the assignment. They're dry, they're banal, they're soulless. I don't get to meet you in any way whatsoever. They are technically capable. And nowhere do I get to meet you. Now, I'm going to talk in terms of gender, which is always fraught with peril. But I'm going to talk in terms of gender based upon experience, knowing as I say this, this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone in this room. Women often have difficulty in college essays bragging about their accomplishments. They tend to underplay the things that they have done, right? But they're very evocative in sort of talking about the things that they have done. Men, on the other hand, are, don't have a problem bragging about what they've done. But they do tend to not be very open or authentic or evocative in their writing. Remember, I'm speaking in broad terms. So women will tend not to boast, but will be very emotionally available in their writing, and men are the direct opposite. So when someone is asking you to discuss an accomplishment that you're proud of, damn it, talk about an accomplishment you are proud of. Bring it to the foreground and let the person who doesn't love you edit you back. But bring it. And gentlemen, if you want to write a great college essay, write it when you're really tired. 11.30 at night, when you're just about done, when the walls are breaking down, that's when you write your college essay. Because there I will get emotion because you are weary. I know it's weird, but that's the kind of stuff that tends to be missing from these. And I hate McEssays. We can hear them from a thousand feet away. There's the McEssay about the trip I took to France. Well, I know the end of that one before I've read the beginning. You're going to eat something weird, usually involving a snail, and that's going to tell me that you're ready for the rigors of college. Oh, God, I hate you. <laughs> Are you going to talk about 
the fumble in the big game and how you lost the ball and made you, oh God, please no, make the bad man stop writing 641 words. Or the tumble that you took as a gymnast. Like, these things are so well known, so trite, so cliched, so hackneyed, please don't write them. Here's a good rule. If you're bored writing it, I will not be delighted reading it. Next slide, please. Um, these are tips, and they're not going to be new to you. I want your honest voice. You don't have to try and impress me. I've seen your high school transcript. I know who you are intellectually. I have seen your activities, the things you have chosen to share with me. I know how you've chosen to spend your time. What I haven't met is you. I haven't met you yet. So be honest. And that's why I used the roommate exercise earlier. Write this essay as though it was to a future roommate. That's so uh, hardwired now into admissions that it's actually a Stanford essay. Write a note to your future roommate. Next one, please. This matters because it's a good guidepost. The story you tell should have details such that no one else could tell this same story. So I'll, I'll tell you about a, uh, an essay I'm reading a lot this year. COVID created a lot of anxiety. COVID created a situation where people were increasingly uncomfortable to sort of break out of their home. There are a lot of stories that accompanied the last 18 months that are not great for us as human beings. But if I just say that, there are thousands of other students who can say the same thing. So tell your story your way. I knew I was in trouble in quarantine when my best conversations were with the cat and then I think the cat started talking back to me. That's when I realized that perhaps I had crossed a bridge too far. So I did the next natural thing. I binge watched Shark Week. Because just the very idea of seeing another animal rend flesh felt just so very, very good to me in a cathartic way. And then I realized I needed to get out more, so I started walking around the neighborhood. And it was weird to think that I was 96 years old and going for a walk, but somehow that worked for me. These are stories about nothing, but they're your stories, featuring things that you did connected to larger themes. And again, does that resonate and make sense, or have I gone wildly off here? I'll pause. Who's got a question or a comment? Hit me. Please, what you got? What are the typical questions? Uh, tell me about a subject that you love and why you loved it. Tell me about a way you express yourself creatively. Tell me anything you want about yourself in any way. Tell me about a challenge you were faced with that you overcame. Tell me about an activity that is precious and meaningful for you. Um, tell me about an academic opportunity you had and how you took advantage of it. And this one's all over private schools. Why do you want to come here? Why here? It's actually called the FIT essay. Why do you want to come to NYU? What is it about this place that draws you? Why do you want to come to Whitman? when you probably didn't even know where it was until 10 minutes ago. What is it about Reed that is so fascinating that you think you belong here? And that's the essay where uh, you gotta do some work. You gotta really think about why is this place good for you? And it ties perfectly back to what Rob was saying. You've done the work and there's seven or eight schools that you know are right for you, that you'd be delighted if all of them took you, and you inherently write the essay that you want to see because you did the work. But did I answer your question? Yes. Swear that was not an accident. Go, what you got? Oh, you just flinched. Any other questions? Next slide, please. That's pretty obvious. If I've already seen that you took all your AP science classes in your high school, I don't want you to write about you taking all your AP science classes in high school, but I would love to know about the rocket you built that blew up on the launch pad. I'd love to see that essay. 
I'd like to think about, I'd like to learn about that time you kind of got in trouble because perhaps you mixed a couple of ingredients that a normal human being shouldn't have mixed. I'd love to learn about sort of the extra astrology class you watched on YouTube where you found out that Pluto was a dwarf planet and no longer counted as part of the solar system. And that just feels fundamentally unfair because Pluto worked really hard to get into the club. I would love for you to write those kinds of things. I just don't need to know about the stuff you've already told me about. So if you say leadership in student government is really important to me, I don't need you to tell me that leadership in student government is really important to me. What I do want to learn is why you chose to join student government. Because that seems somehow thankless. Like no one ever comes to you and says, great job there with balancing the budget. Or congratulations on winning the election, four votes to two. So why did you do it? What drew you to student government? Why did you stay? What compels you? Bats issuing sonar. Let me meet you. Next slide, please. This goes back to my parent point. I want to see how I'm doing on time. Parents don't sound like 16 and 17 year olds. And even, uh, here's a great rule. If you write a sentence that if you said to a friend they would laugh you out of the room, like, who just showed up at my lunch? Don't put it in the essays. I want your voice. I don't want your academic voice. I don't want your chemistry lab voice. I want your true voice here. I want to meet you. And this is the one opportunity you get to say, look beyond the numbers. Look beyond the arithmetic and meet me as a person. So this is something that was taught to me recently that really resonated and I want to share it with you. There are two words. Word A is cohesion, cohesion. Word B is congruence. What is cohesion? Cohesion is to tell a story that is remarkably consistent about yourself, that is reflected throughout your application. You are a studious person. You enjoy academics. You enjoy learning things. You love to learn new things. You love to teach and tutor these new things. And your favorite thing to do is to learn something new. That would be cohesion. The same kind of story told in multiple ways at depth. You reveal who you are. Does that make sense? You control cohesion because it is your story. Congruence. What is the college looking for this year from its applicants, particularly the highly competitive ones? What do they want? And by the way, that changes every year. So the oboist they took two years ago, they're not going to take another oboist for three years. You cannot control congruence. Colleges control that. But if you do cohesion well, which is telling your story in your best possible way, it is the easiest way for you to match to what they want because they will recognize what they are seeking in your stories. If you don't give me cohesion, if I can't look at you and say, that's my trombonist, that's my musician, that's the person who's going to riff in my jazz club, if you hide that from me, you can't meet me where I am, which is the congruent side. So the more you reveal who you are, the more likely you are to be accepted by the places that you know fit who you are. And at this stage, what you're seeing is Rob's lecture and my lecture meeting halfway, and people really should turn off their cell phones before they come and give a speech. Next. Here's what I'm talking about.
What's the story? A kid who cleans his bathroom. Now, imagine dad. From the cultures we grew up in, which were deeply academic, probably reasonably strict. I certainly got that from British boarding schools. Trying to convince our parents that my essay to Oxford is going to involve cleaning the bathroom. That is not going to be particularly well received in any part of my household. But it is a great essay. It's a great essay because the voice is real, because you learn the kid is playing football, because you learn the kid has a sense of responsibility, and you learn the kid can tell a story well and crisply and quickly. That's a great essay. But the topic is cleaning the bathroom. And I share this with you so you can see the power of authentic writing independent of topic. Your education, your fear, your parental influence can interfere with your voice and nothing is more precious in this journey than is your voice. Now I've gone through this three times with three separate kids. I believe what I am telling you. I truly do. It is so hard to walk that walk yourself. And I've done it three times. Three times I have not seen my children's essays until after they have applied to college. And three times I almost broke. Like, I just don't trust that she will get this right. And there was this moment where I had to look myself in the mirror and say, trust her, trust her journey. Trust him, trust his journey. And you know when I finally read the essays? They were great. They weren't particularly well written. But they were great because in every essay I heard my kid's voice. And I know if I had been, they would have been better written and less interesting. And that's the lesson to take away. Next slide, please. Yeah, don't talk about any of these. Just don't. Um, remember I told you the Stanford essay story early about the Bible and the works of William Shakespeare. So for years, one of Rob and my jobs was to hire the teachers at Princeton Review. Rob would do it in New York, I would do it in California. And if well, you wanted to teach at Princeton Review, and this is still true today, you had to be good at what one thing. It wasn't standardized testing. It was, couldn't you teach? Can you take what's in here and put it in there? Do you have the gift? So when we would hire teachers, we would audition them. They had to come in and they had to teach us something in five minutes. And over the years and the thousands of teachers that we have interviewed, there are topics that if you introduce them, we're like, oh goodness gracious, make the bad person stop talking. One of them is how to play tennis. Another is the particularly irritating Japanese art of making animals out of pieces of paper, origami. So those two topics are just sort of the death knell for us. So I, I was in LA and there were three people coming in for an interview and the first guy's wearing tennis gear and has a tennis racket and he gets up and he's super energetic but I fell asleep in second two. Then the young lady gets up, takes out a piece of paper, and starts making a duck. I'm like, this is the world's worst interview group. I've got tennis, I've got origami, and I figure the third guy is going to make a tennis racket out of a piece of paper. <laughs> so I am not in a good mood. But the third guy comes up, and you know those chains that they attach to pens in the bank so you won't steal the pen? He has one of those chains. And I apologize to the film crew. He does this. He's not talking. And he starts to shove it up his nose. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> and he pulls it out of his mouth. Yes! I'm like, that is disgusting and yet oddly compelling. 
And then he took out a skull and he sort of showed how the sinus cavity worked. And I, I don't know what this says about us at Princeton Review, but that's the guy we hired. <laughs> but can you imagine? I got this great job today by shoving things up my nose. It's, it's just not a normal job interview, but the voice and the compelling and the story and the courage and the honesty and the joy that went with it. That's just all this is. It's so gloriously human. And so much of it feels so gloriously like a bank loan, paperwork, and all this stuff. No, if you let them see you, they will. Next slide, please. So there's your review. Not rocket science. Be authentic. Tell me a story that only you could tell. Please don't repeat yourself and use your own voice so that you sound like yourself. Not magic, and yet so very, very hard to do. Next slide, please. Um, these are the eight topics. You know, madame, how you'd answered uh, us earlier, sort of what the topics are. These, in a nutshell, are kind of what they're asking. But remember, they don't care which one you choose to write about yourself. Always think about what you want to write before you write it. So, what story am I going to tell? How is it uniquely my own? What stories am I going to build about? Go. Uh, whatever topic you pick. I want to talk about my love of raising hamsters. Duck yourself out. I'm fascinated already. You're weird, and I want to know more about you. So anything goes. It's just a blanket topic that's, that's one of the eight. And remember, you write on four of them. Any other questions on that? Next slide, please. This is my gift to you. College-wise, similar to what Rob has done with his YouTube series, College-wise has taken its entire intellectual property the forms that we use, the advice that we give, the videos we have created, we've put the whole thing online, very much in a how-to, how do you go through this college journey, and it sort of sits there, and it's free for you guys. So I want to end, and sort of write for the theme of the day, personally. So, I'm the guy who was one of the five founders of the Princeton Review. So I know a ridiculous amount about standardized testing, more than is healthy for any normal human being, right? But I've also worked for years within CollegeWise, which is America's largest independent consulting group for college. And like Rob says, he and I have visited more colleges than normal, and we've spoken about college admissions in America all over the world. That's sort of our brand. And my 17-year-old daughter, comes up to me a year and a half ago, and she says, I have a question about the SAT and college. And before I could say a word, she looked at me with utter contempt and said, I have no idea why I'm asking you, what do you know, and walked off. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, delayed response, like, I, everything, I actually know everything, but it didn't matter. And it reminded me to my fellow mothers and my fellow fathers, we're the cheerleaders here. That's our job, to celebrate every win, to console should something bad happen, to be there to sort of go, this journey ends well and I believe in you, and to center your son or your daughter or other into the middle of this journey, because the more they own it and the more they run with it, the better the outcome and the more joyful this will be. And that, right on the dot, is the end of this particular presentation, and I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you for having me.